There are major challenges facing the world today as associated with changes in global climate. These changes have far-reaching implication for weather patterns, ecosystems, and economies. Rigorous scientific analysis must assess the risks, uncertainty, and opportunities clearly. UC San Diego researchers seek to understand the environment on all spatial and temporal scales, enable effective use of that knowledge, and engineer solutions in global societies. At the same time, finding feasible and effective measures to respond to environmental risks requires fresh thinking about political, economic, and social forces that determine our set of choices. You might think about the global climate system as comprised of three components the ocean atmosphere system, natural and human infrastructure that we are interested in protecting, and the forces at work that can drive changes in the climate system. The real system is very complex with all of these components closely interconnected and affecting each other. Some of the challenges that we're facing are associated with uncertainty in our understanding of the system and in defining the associated risks. One of the objectives for research is to convert this uncertainty to predictive capacity and to identify opportunities for solutions. Our first group of speakers will describe some of the work being carried out here at UC San Diego that is expanding our understanding of the global climate system. Dr. Gino Pollock from the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department will describe how our understanding of physical processes plays an essential role in assessing risks for ecosystems like coral reefs. Alumnus Gina Pollock is an Associate Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. His research focuses on understanding the physical dynamics of environmental systems, specifically on connections between the coast and open space. From an engineering perspective, this research has implications for predicting storm surge, tsunami inundation, water quality, and coastal erosion. Tonight, you'll hear how his experiences as a surfer and sandcastle builder growing up on the coast of Panama spurred his interest in this path of inquiry. I'm very excited to be here tonight and thrilled to be a part of this Founders Day celebration. So, uh, and honored to be sharing the stage with the rest of these uh, great uh, UCSD researchers tonight. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions about my title, and so I, uh, I think I need to address um, uh, or acknowledge uh, my wife, Lisa, who's uh, also a UCSD alum, but she's not an engineer. She's a writer who happens to have a number of stories uh, that have appeared in these chicken soup uh, books. And uh, when I told her my original title, which had something to do with uh, wave boundary layers and turbulent dissipation and irregular roughness, she didn't think that was a, was a good idea. So I, I came up with something a little bit more chicken soupy. Um, uh, also looking at that title, you might ask yourself why an engineer would be talking to you about coral reefs. And uh, to begin with, there's a lot we can learn from uh, coral reefs in terms of fluid processes over irregular complex surfaces, which is uh, a topic that has a lot of implications for engineering. In addition, uh, I'm going to be talking about physical processes in the context of coral reefs, but these physical processes also play uh, important roles in um, many other coastal dynamics problems that have implications for environmental uh, engineering, uh, coastal engineering like uh, storm surge, erosion, water quality, etc. And then finally, I think there's a long history of uh, close interaction between engineering here at UC San Diego and oceanography at Scripps in terms of trying to understand these physical processes. And that's uh, personally what drew me here to work on my PhD research when I was working in mechanical engineering, I was working with a, a physical oceanography professor, uh, Larry Army, at Scripps. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit to start with about some of the pressures that coral reefs are facing. We're all aware of many of the stresses that uh, are occurring as a result of changing climate. And I'm going to show you to start with this. Uh, this is the famous uh, Keeling curve in red that uh, shows the changes in CO2 
in the atmosphere over the last 50 years. And so there's a significant increase. And it turns out that increase is also reflected in uh, the ocean. Uh, the data in blue ref uh, show observations from Station Aloha, which is located just north of Hawaii. And so there's an increase in carbon dioxide in, in, uh, in the ocean as well. And then this increase, because of the carbonate chemistry in the ocean, results in an increase in acidity. And so that's reflected in a decrease in pH that you see there in green. So the oceans are getting more acidic. Now, you may know that coral reefs are made of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is also the main uh, uh, component in limestone. But it also turns out to be, uh, as you may know, the main component in Tums. And it plays pretty much the same role uh, that uh, well, so, which a lot of people take for acid indigestion. And, and of course, coral reefs play very much the same role in the ocean. Uh, at, just like the Tums dissolves in your stomach uh, to counteract the acidity, the coral reefs dissolve to counteract increasing acidity in the ocean. So clearly, that's not a good thing for corals. Um, now, uh, I give this as one example. There's many other uh, things that are stressing uh, ecosystems on the planet. I'm going to be talking about physical processes. And uh, these phys understanding these physical processes is essential if we want to be able to understand how these ecosystems, like coral reefs, will respond and, and so that we can predict and assess the risks that are associated with changing climate. So uh, why should corals care about physics? Well, uh, to begin with, we need to understand that corals occur in environments that are very low in nutrients, essentially oceanic deserts. And so uh, the physics can resolve this uh, in two ways. Uh, first, currents, which are associated with tides or waves, uh, are essentially uh, work as a pipeline to bring nutrients towards uh, uh, the coast from deep sources offshore. Uh, and we'll give that the symbol capital U. And then uh, uh, fluctuations, chaotic variations near the bed uh, which we'll call uh, this, use this symbol U star, uh, we call those turbulence. Um, and those are uh, very useful in increasing the exchange. Those, those help coral to exchange nutrients between the water col column and the bed, uh, much in the same way that uh, the sugar in your coffee or tea dissolves faster when you mix it with a spoon, right? So uh, because corals, can't move to get their food, they rely on the physics to bring it to them. And in the same way, they rely on, cor on, on physics to uh, deal with waste removal, uh, transport of larvae for reproduction, uh, sedimentation. But of course, too much physics is also not a good thing. And uh, if these forces are too great, these can lead to structural stress and breakage. So there's a happy point that uh, corals want to be at in terms of physics. I think this video. Uh, illustrates very well these two processes that I've been describing. This is, an anime, or this is a video, actually, of laboratory experiments carried out by colleagues at Stanford University uh, showing uh, experiments of uh, flow over coral. And what they've done is they have fluorescent dye injected in the coral and a laser sheet to visualize this. And I think this, again, shows these two processes very well. This capital U, the currents, are associated with the back and forth motion that's carrying the dye on a large scale. And then the turbulence are these very small fluctuations near the bed that are uh, um, carrying dye, in this case, away from the bed, much in the same way that they would carry uh, wastes away and also nutrients to the bed. Now, uh, Matthew offered just uh, talked to you a lot about internal waves and how internal waves travel across the ocean much in the same way that uh, surface waves uh, travel across. And in the same way that these uh, waves, uh, that surface waves approach a shoreline, uh, internal waves also approach coasts, break. And it turns out that that process, the processes associated with internal waves, are very important for corals. And so to understand those physical processes, we went to the Kilinala Observatory on the south shore of Oahu uh, to carry out some work with uh, colleagues from Stanford and Oregon State. Uh, Kilinalu is an observatory. It's essentially a in-ocean uh, laboratory that I established and ran uh, for about eight years until 2012. And uh, it has uh, experimental sites at about 30 feet and about 70 feet depth. 
Uh, and each one of these sites provides uh, what amounts to an extension cord. Uh, it provides um, Ethernet ports and power so that you can run customized experiments. And so as part of this experiment, we built a 26-foot tower that we deployed at 75 feet depth, uh, which you see in the images here. On the left is my master's student, Lauren Molina, and on the right is a, uh, a Stanford PhD student, Mike Squibb, adjusting some of the instrumentation. And the instrumentation on the tower is very similar to some of the things that Matthew uses in the deep ocean. We use acoustics to measure velocity, we measure turbulence and changes in temperature to try to get an idea of what, uh, what the processes are associated with these shoaling, uh, these internal waves that are washing up on, on the reefs. And this is what internal waves look like when they wash up on the reefs. Uh, so the top plot, so what we're looking at here is images of density, but the density is primarily driven by temperature, so you can consider this as though it were temperature. The top plot shows about eight days as a, and versus depth on the vertical axis, uh, about eight days of data, and you can see that mostly the water over the reef is warm, indicated by the red regions, but with intermittent uh, pulses of this sharp blue uh, which is associated with these internal waves. So these waves are washing up on the slope, on the, on the uh, reefs, in much the same way that surface waves wash up on the beach and knock over your sandcastle. Uh, on the bottom, if we zoom in on this, we're looking at about 10 hours of uh, data that here, and you can see again this uh, primarily warm water with very sharp change as this wave washes up and extends over most of the depth, at least most of the height of the tower. And that cold water then remains on the reef for about three hours before it washes back off. Okay. Now this, uh, this cold water, these internal waves do a lot more than just cool off the reef, which is in itself an important process. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a plot that shows the typical variation in nutrients, which the re reefs need, which is essentially your chicken soup, uh, and uh, as a function of depth. And so as I was describing earlier, there's very little nutrient content at the surface in red, and blue shows temperature. So these uh, cold pulses that uh, are associated with the internal waves bring nutrients up to the reef uh, from down deep. So that's an important process. And so these internal waves then play two roles in the reefs. One of them is they provide this capital U, this pipeline that uh, provides a supply of, of uh, nutrients. And then they also, it turns out, they also increase this U star, this turbulence uh, uh, near the bed that helps uh, increase the transport. Our work has shown us that uh, the cross-shore flow associated with these uh, internal waves increases by a factor of five uh, relative to when there are no internal waves. And other work by uh, people at Scripps, including Jim Leichter, have shown that for reefs in Florida, this amounts to about a hundredfold increase in nutrients because this water that's coming up is so rich in nutrients. Okay, so I've told you a little bit about uh, this capital U, um, and uh, really a lot of the focus in my work and my group's work is in trying to uh, quantify and predict this U star. What is the level of this turbulence associated with the flow over the reef? And there's three parts to this problem. Uh, the first part is determining the currents, say associated with tides or, or, or waves or internal waves like I just showed you. The second part is actually defining the reef geometry. What does the reef look like? And how do we assign a number to that reef so that we can describe its roughness? And then the third part is resolving and predicting this turbulence, this uh, U-star, based on measurements. Okay, so I've showed you a little bit about how uh, we've looked at internal waves for uh, determining this capital U. There's other, other mechanisms as well. And I'm gonna describe a little bit about what we do uh, to define the reef geometry. Uh, uh, one of the key tools we use is um, an autonomous underwater vehicle, or an AUV. And this is basically an underwater robot that we program and send out over the reef to map and try to get a picture of what this uh, reef bed looks like. Uh, it uses acoustics and uh, video, like you see here on the right, uh, to give us a picture of what the reef looks like and it gives us maps that look like this. In this case, it's about a kilometer squared around the Kilonalu Observatory in Hawaii, and what we're seeing are the variations in roughness at different sizes uh, for this region. And what we've learned from this is that the roughness can be described by what we call a spectral distribution. That means that there's roughness 
at many different sizes, all the way from very small sizes to very large uh, corals. Now, this poses a problem from the engineering perspective because uh, the typical engineering approach is to identify what the characteristic size is for a boundary and then use that size to predict uh, what the U, this U star turbulence is. However, what we see is that a coral reef doesn't have a characteristic size, so we have a problem. Uh, and so uh, a lot of our work then uh, has been directed towards making measurements of this U star so that we can connect it to these observations of uh, reef uh, variations. And so we've made field observations at many places around the Pacific, a number of field sites that you see pictures of here. And then more recently, we've been carrying out uh, laboratory experiments and computer simulations as well of flow over idealized uh, boundaries uh, where the boundary, like you see here in this image, uh, has a range of different sizes. Now, this no longer looks like a coral reef, of course, but it turns out that this uh, boundary has been designed, this bottom has been designed, so that it has similar characteristics to what you see, uh, what we've measured for a coral reef. And uh, these are uh, laser-induced fluorescence uh, measurements made by my postdoc here, uh, Payam Agsai. And uh, what you see here again is this large uh, capital U, and then you see the turbulence uh, near the bed. And um, what these observations have shown us, what these experiments and numerical simulations have shown us, is that uh, it's not the amplitude of the roughness that's important uh, for these complex boundaries. Instead, we can now define an average cavity shape based on the variations that you see near the bed, and it's that quantity that actually determines uh, what the characteristics of this U star are. Okay, so uh, hopefully I've uh, managed to tell you, uh, convey a little bit about what, uh, how physical processes are important for coral reefs. We've seen how internal waves, for example, are important in determining this capital U. Uh, we, I've shown you how this U star uh, is important in facilitating the local supply for reef organisms. And oh, again, as I noted earlier, this, uh, these processes that I'm describing are not unique to reefs. They're really important for many coastal uh, problems. Um, and uh, again, you know, these ecosystems are under stress uh, from changes in climate, and understanding these physical processes is critical for us to be able to assess the risks that are associated with climate change. Okay, thank you.